Live from the MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube covering Splunk.com 2015. Brought to you by Splunk. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Rick. Okay, hey, welcome back everyone. We are live here in Las Vegas at Splunk.com 2015. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle, joined my co-host Jeff Frick, the GM of our Cube operations. Our next guest is Sinead Hall Antani, CTO of Splunk, new CTO on the job. Welcome to the Cube and welcome to Splunk. Thanks, appreciate it. Like I'm like I'm welcoming to Splunk. I don't work there. But, <laughs> but we've, well, been, we've been here. We've been here for four years. Yeah, We're like yeah, an yeah, incumbent, months. like, you know. <laughs> A tick in the in the ecosystem. We can't get rid of us. Nice. We love we love Splunk. We've covered it for four years. You're new. Great. What's it like in the job now? You know, four months. What attracted you to Splunk? Why did you want to work here? And tell us what happened when you got here. Yeah. So it's an absolutely awesome job. I feel like a kid in a candy store. So first week on the job, um, I've got customers coming in talking to me about uh, high end lasers, doing chip manufacturing, and streaming prevent or data for preventive maintenance. First day on the job, learning about a completely new industry. Second day on the job, I've got a big bank coming in talking about fraud detection and money laundering. Third day on the job, I've got government agencies on insider threat. Fourth day on the job, it's connected cars from the largest manufacturer. Same exact product, completely different use cases, and it wasn't just PowerPoint. They had already done these problems, or solved these problems, they wanted to know how to take it to the next level. So I mean, just imagine yeah. completely diverse problems, completely versatile technology, and uh, I said, kid in a candy store, it's been the, the coolest ride so far. So Splunk is a great product because those are four different use cases, yeah. core platform, but now technology is enabling other creative things. What other things technically are inside the platform that are going to, I mean, let me rephrase. The platform is enabling technology. What is coming on top of Splunk? We see analytics, that's pretty obvious. The killer app. Yeah. What, uh, what, uh, what are the technologies that are out there that are on your radar and Splunk's radar in terms of the key enablers to connect into the core platform? Yeah, so, so one thing is, let's level set a little bit on what do we mean by, by core platform? So, it's kind of the story I've been telling around the history of, of Splunk, if you will, is, um, Think about, imagine a mainframe environment. In a mainframe, it's a converged infrastructure. You have all these VMs running, mm -hmm. and um, you could route all the logs from those VMs into a single Z log stream. And everything was right there, it was all fit, you know, there's no moving parts, or very few moving parts, and it worked. Well then, 10 years ago, we had SOA, and distributed services. And then the, the Yahoo's and the Google's of the world, you had very large scale distributed searches. And suddenly, not all that data was in one place anymore. And when I was a CIO before this, 34% of my operational tickets were requests for logs. So the origins of Splunk were bringing together all of that data, making searchable, indexable, being able to run analysis, and really facilitating that investigative loop. So if you think of an outage, um, you get this error, and you have no idea what caused it. So show me all the logs, errors from five minutes before and three minutes after, what just happened? Well, that's interesting, let's go search that instead. So it's this investigative cycle. And you can start doing really cool advanced correlation as a result. So that's the core. And what we did was, the, 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 rea the investigation for an outage was very similar to the investigation for hunting a breach if you're a security person. So we suddenly found ourselves solving really interesting security problems, and we didn't even have a security product, right? We won Best Fraud Detection Award a uh, few months ago. We don't even have a fraud product, which is cool. So the core is very versatile, and we've got these lenses into the core. So you've got a security lens with capabilities in Splunk Enterprise Security that it's a user experience, a set of questions oriented around that security analyst, that hunter. We've got an IT operational lens into that same data that op, that's oriented around that ops person and the kinds of things that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we have is this platform, very versatile, mm -hmm. and different lenses into it. So that's kind of the, the, the Splunk company and the product today. What's cool is IoT is an example. It's just another data source for us. We can already ingest data at scale, we can already uh, uh, speak many, or ingest data over many languages and protocols and dialects. We can do very high performance sense and respond. We can do geographically distributed search. Things that are critical to IoT. So that's just another data source and all the, the, the magic and power of Splunk just plays right to our, to our strengths. You mentioned um, the data's not everywhere. You mentioned some hyperscalers, some whatever they're called these days, web scalers, hyperscalers, the large web companies, Yahoo, Google, sure. you, we know who they are. But now that's not the enterprise. But DevOps now is coming on strong. 
you've got this agile, rapid development environment, uh, you know, continuous integration, and then you got the IT ops converging in on the dev. Yeah. That's causing a great migration to the, to the cloud. Sure. Cloud and analytics kind of go together. Yeah. So, do you see that as an opportunity for Splunk? Um, and, and, and if so, how? So uh, last year I was on stage as a customer and I talked about the, uh, the transformation I drove at, at, uh, at G Capital. And I'll tell you about DevOps, for example. Uh, one of the mantras I pushed out was, in IT, we're not in the business of selling religion, we're in the business of selling candles because every religion needs candles, right? So DevOps transformations fail, or agile transformations fail because the agile team will argue against the waterfall team and it's a very subjective, very religious debate. Or the DevOps team will argue with the ITIL team and a very subjective, very religious debate. So one of the key things that, that we did and we were successful in our transformation was, we sold candles to the app developer platform. You know, if you, uh, if you want to go live, you've got to have secure code and you've got to make sure that you've got zero vulnerabilities. Well, you can either wait till the end of the release and get a whole bunch of, 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 of findings or I can give you a report every day through this automated service. And then path of least resistance, developers use this automated service. So you artificially create bureaucracy to drive the, and create a path of least resistance to drive the right behavior. Well, one of the cool things we did was, I had um, a bunch of automated steps to, to, to validate code was of the right quality in a completely uh, automated deployment pipeline, and I splunked all that data. So I could tell you in real time, my best developers, my worst developers, which developers struggled to write secure code, which developers struggled to write performant code, mm -hmm. my best and worst contractor vendors. And I'd pit them up against one another and say, you know, contractor A, you had the worst code this quarter, you better do better, you better improve, or you're not going to get the contract renewed. So the key thing in here is transparency. Yeah. Because you can't pull that Jedi mind trick of there's nothing to see here, all the boxes are green, because I've got the data at my fingertips as a decision maker. So I think that really changes the game in how we develop software, how we run an organization, mm -hmm. and that level of transparency allows the business to move at market speed, yeah. where they can quickly make decisions and pivot and iterate based on the actual data at hand, yeah, not some subjective piece of information. That's awesome, that's awesome. So I got to ask the next question, this is a great, great conversation. We could go all day, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is so much fun. Um, data silos, big, sure. big issue that's kind of not being talked about much. I mean, silos in general love to be talking about, people love to talk about breaking down silos, but data in particular. Uh, yeah. People have recognized that data is a competitive advantage. Yeah. Data driven, with data driven sales, data driven organization, blah, 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 goes to a nice, nice punchline. But people are hoarding their data. So, Twitter doesn't share their data with Facebook, Facebook doesn't share their LinkedIn, organization, that's my department. How do you get an open data environment? Because data needs to interact with each other. And that's what Splunk has proven. Right. That works really well. Yeah. How, how, where are we with this whole data, open data issue? Is so, it early stages? Is it a crisis? Do we worry? What needs to change, if any? So let's split that into two pieces. The first is, within an enterprise, you've got these data cartels, which is absolutely idiotic, right? I mean, your job is to serve the business and drive revenue and better serve your customers, yet you've got these kings and queens of the organizations hoarding their data and keeping everyone else off of it. And I kind of jo joke that, you know, the, the, you've got three groups of people in an organization. You've got those eager to collaborate. They believe in what you're trying to do. They want to do what's best for the customer. You've got the Eeyores or the cynics that don't think anything's ever going to work. It's too hard, you know. You got those eager to be offended, which are the kings and queens of the org looking out for number one. And it's those eager to be offended that tend to hoard the data and create these data cartels. And so what's important is, and this is more of a, 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 a culture at the top, is if you've got a culture of transparency, if you always put the customer first, and you make everyone measured on customer experience and customer success, you'll naturally start to break these walls down. And you'll naturally start to share because it's these advanced correlations. It's connecting a, a, a nugget of information from this data, data stream and another piece of information somewhere else that seems completely unrelated, but when combined gives you incredibly interesting insight. And that is how you drive much greater value to your customers. That's how you drive much better profit margins, much greater capabilities yeah. and so on. And so within an organization, we absolutely have to break these cartels down. Mm -hmm. And those that have cartels put themselves first, not the business first. Yeah. And I think that's a dying culture. I think that, that uh, people are starting to recognize that that's just not going to survive. Now separately, um, I think we, we can think of them as walled gardens, right? Twitter's a walled garden. 
If you're within the Twitter ecosystem, you've got access to their data and you do interesting things. Facebook's a wild garden. You've got, if you're inside their ecosystem, you've got access to their data and you've got high value. I don't know how long it'll take for these walled gardens to, to, to better work together. We see that, right? Uh, we see open, open gov movements and open data movements within government as a starting point. We see that amongst the web companies. Um, but I think as time goes on, customers are going to demand that level of integration. And I think the industry will catch up to truly There'll always be it. someone who will have an innovation or an invention that will un unwind the data cartels. Right, At exactly. some At some level. It's yeah. just a matter of time. You can, I mean, really have to, it's brute force yes. to get rid of those. But, but I also think that, I think the, the, the value proposition has changed. When data was sparse, data cartels were a source of tremendous value, right? I remember when you're a sales guy in your early days, you know, your Rolodex, literally the stack of cards was your gold. But now the data, there's so much more data, there's much more value in sharing in unique and innovative ways. So you, you actually have more power being a data sharer now than you used to be by being a data hoarder. And I, I just don't think those data hoarders and the data cartels have kind of figured that out. They can yeah. actually have more power by sharing that data in unique and innovative ways. Yeah, uh, you know, let's take an extreme example for a moment. So, um, so I, had a, I had a mentor once who was uh, driving to work one day, had a heart attack on the road, veers off and, and hits a telephone pole. The impact from the pole, followed by the impact from the airbag, restarted his heart, and he lived. If you think, it's an amazing story, right? If you think about that problem for a moment, technically now, I've got a smartwatch. Well, I don't right now, but I, you, know, you can imagine a smartwatch. And on that smartwatch, you've got time series data of your heartbeats. And you can start to look at anomalies. Your heart, heart rate has suddenly changed or something, doing something different. Well, that on its own isn't all that valuable. Separately, I've got my skin temperature. Well, suddenly changes in skin temperature on its own don't mean anything. But I, maybe I'm instrumenting data from the car. And on its own, I've suddenly accelerated or slammed on the brakes or swerved with lateral Gs. On its own, that doesn't mean anything. But if I correlate those three sources of data together, I've detected an adverse health condition. I can take action, slow the car down, turn on the hazards, dial 911. So you've got seemingly independent sources of data, mm -hmm. independent streams of data. You can do advanced correlation and actually solve really interesting, very high value, very high impact problems. And that's all over the place. In every aspect of the organization, in every business, and in every problem, you've got these innocuous or completely disparate sources of data that we can integrate, correlate, and, and actually take action on. I want to get your thoughts on a trend that's happening now, and I want to compare it vis-a-vis -vis the web. Um, and I noticed you ha I worked at IBM in, in your past life, so the web was a, a big part of, of the growth of e-commerce, e-business back then. Sure. Um, and I, I'll use IBM as an example because I like their strategy there. E-business was, e-commerce basically, the web. And they had a good read on that. Yeah. But now IBM's talking about social business and, and, and as an indicator. So I'm bringing that up as a, a discussion point. This new fabric that's developing, the sharing economy as Jeff was kind of hinting out. You got Airbnb, Ubers out there, always being on every keynote, oh, Uber of this and Uber of that. Yeah. But what's happening is a new social web is cre being created, a new fabric, a data fabric, a new kind of mobile first, DevOps, all that stuff's kind of coming together. What is this new phenomenon? Is, is it something as big as the web was as a platform? Because websites, no one goes to websites anymore. I mean, yeah. a website is like, okay, it's there, right. but I also got a mobile app native, iOS, yeah. Android. I have Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, other tools and sharing devices. Yeah. So a whole new fabric of infrastructure is developing. How do you look at that and, and uh, as, a, as a CTO, as someone in the industry, what do, how do you make sense of that? What do you, what so, do you view this? So you, you've, been, you've described a bunch of technology trends, but for a moment, think about this through the lens of the business. If you're a bank, you only talk to your customers when they owe you money, like if you're a credit card company. You only talk to your customers when they owe you money or they've missed a payment, right? It's a very negative interaction with your customers. Or if you do leases and loans and so on. And how do you transform that to be a much more positive and ongoing conversation? And so, if, um, if I can somehow understand that you've leased a, a piece of equipment, you've leased a, a fleet of cars for me, as an example. And if I understand how you use those cars, I can come back to you in an ongoing basis and say, you know, the fleet of cars that you have aren't the right mix for your business. You know, you, you do a lot of city driving, you got a lot of SUVs, I think we should change your fleet up to do something else. You become much more proactive in your conversation with the business. And you become- Relevant. And, and become relevant. And you're not just a financier. And a business partner, right. You are a business partner. You're driving higher value outcomes, 
with your, with your customer base. I think that's what's really important, is that the reach of, your, of the business is far beyond anything we've had before. The line between digital businesses and physical businesses are blurring. And that reach gives you a chance to transform your conversation, to not just be some negative, yeah. you owe me money, yeah. but really reach out and drive these higher value interactions on an ongoing basis, which allows you in business terms to either protect your premium and charge higher prices, increase the spend of your existing customers, capture net new customers. So I think that's what's really important. When you look at an Uber, or you look at Airbnb, or you look at any of these other new and emerging digital properties, what are they doing? They have this ongoing, continuous conversation yep. with the customer. And they're always trying to find a way to enhance that customer experience and drive interesting, higher value outcomes as a result. My next qu final question, because well, we're running out of time, but it's more on the development side now, so I totally love that answer, great answer. Yep. Uh, in 08, I wrote, 2008, I wrote a post on my blog called Data's the New Development Kit. Sure. Back when there were development kits. Back now, it's just <laughs> open source, right? Yeah. So, and we laugh because we know what that means. So, but now, let's flash forward today. If you're a developer, you're dealing with data as a development resource versus, oh, I'm going to create a database to store data that I'm, that's part of an app. So, share with us your, your vision and how you see data as a development tool. Yep per se, because data's living, right? So data, you know, just because it'd be active or passive or you know, cold or warm, whatever. But data's now a part of the development. How are developers using data? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so let's take kind of, uh, I talked about this business operations center and, and running the business in real time. So I've got a bunch of streaming data coming into my environment. And they're really interesting real time questions to ask that data. But at the same time, as the data gets older, I'm going to age it out and start to ask historical questions of that data and start doing historical analysis. And they start entering into this data science development loop. I've got a ton of data, I'm going to be doing models, building apps in R, checking out my R squared values to make sure the models are correct. And what happens is you've got a, a ton of data that's historical. And you want to start building and developing those models through real-time information. So you start sampling that real-time data. So what happens is your data science development platform isn't just a chunk of, of data over the last 10 years. Think of like stock markets. You can get 10 years of stock data and do a bunch of back testing, but eventually your development life cycle is, well, let's start getting real-time feeds and let's start testing this model off of sample data. And as you harden that model, you want to push that model to the edge, to as close to real-time as you can, so you can get that fast response. So injecting real-time in with historical data gives you a better prism to look at the results. Right. And, and it's so. a blend, it's exactly, you get a much better prism, a more complete view, you ask real-time questions, you ask yeah. historical questions, and sample data has always been a, a struggle. So yeah. you start to really integrate, and you have a much more robust data lifecycle strategy, yeah. which I think is really lacking in organizations. And you'll today. see things that by mashing the data up like that, it'll makes the, it makes the overall data more valuable. Right, absolutely. And then you start enriching that data with your existing BI environment, or other pieces of like OpenGov data. You start decorating this information, and now you've got your core uh, data that's incredibly valuable to you, you're adding or decorating or enhancing it and suddenly you've got a much more complete view of what's going on. You yeah. have much more interesting insights as a result. That's awesome. And you know, so data will be part of the development process. Yeah. You know, <laughs> another really important point though, and I had this experience when I was at, at, at Capital, is um, when you've got a, a spectrum of users from very tech savvy to not very tech savvy at all, which is very typical in the world. I mean, we've got people that run their business on three by five cards. We've got people that run their business on the most advanced you know, technologies. How do you start telling stories with your data? I think that to me is a really interesting problem. So one of the things we did in my inventory finance business, which is an incredibly cutting edge technology platform that we had at, at, at GE, we ended up having this, this data storytelling funnel. So I wanted 90% of my insights to be consumed, or uh, my insights to be consumed by 90% of my customer base. That spectrum of tech savvy to tech illiterate. So the what, what was the insight had to be really easy to use, high, easy to consume. Think of the, the email you get after your, your fantasy football weekend. You should, you should bench Tom Brady this Saturday because he's not good with the strong inside rush in the rain, right? And it, even though there's very complicated data science behind well, that. Well, I keep Brady out there personally. I know, I'm a <laughs> Pats fan. I'm, yeah, yeah, he's yeah, on yeah. fire, yeah. it's absolutely Bronk awesome. Bronk and Edelman, yeah. My. But, uh, <laughs> nah, he's been tearing it up. But uh, well, what's interesting there is you've got um, complex insights and analyses that were done to draw that conclusion, but it was delivered to the customer base in a, in a very Small. consumable way. Now, you've got the what. So the what might be the demand for speedboats is going to go up next year, and a dealer's going to adjust the, the kinds of inventory they're going to order. Well, half of those people are going to say, why? Why do I think the demand for speedboats is going to go up? And now you need traceability in that insight, traceability in the outcome. 
half of them are going to ask what if. Well, what if gas prices tank? What effect does that have on the demand for speedboats versus sailboats? And then half of them are going to ask, well, well, let's go have a strategic conversation. So I think that within the data science world, within big data, and within BI and so on, it's the real-time and historical analysis combined with data storytelling that really starts to become a differentiator. Yeah, we're getting over the hook here. Getting we're, getting, the hook, we're, getting, yeah. we're way over, but excellent, we can go for another hour. Of course. Uh, love to continue this conversation. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, and congratulations on your new role. Um, they're, psyched to, they're psyched to have you, I'm sure. Appreciate it, no, it's, um, I'm glad to be here, it's a great time. Thanks for your time here too. Thank you. I guess it's theCUBE, it's our fourth year and we love talking about Splunk, so much, so much diversity and so much excitement. It really is a, uh, a not great for a kid to be in a candy store like this, so uh, we love it too. We'll be right back more after this short break.